everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Seven Simple Steps to Time Mastery. My name is Steve, and I'm the marketing manager here at Surefire Local. And I'm really excited to be your host today, and I welcome back Mark G. Richardson as today's featured speaker. But first, in case you're not as familiar with who Surefire Local is, we're located in Northern Virginia, and our all-in-one local marketing platform allows you to guide your digital marketing investments from a single command center, and that provides actionable insights so you can generate more business. Our mission here is a simple one. We want to help educate local businesses on a wide range of topics to help you succeed. And we want to know, we want to know who you are too. So let us know where you're joining us from today. You can do that by using the chat feature you'll see in the control panel. And then two quick reminders before I pass things over to Mark. Everyone will get the recording of this chat in an email tomorrow. And like I mentioned, you can use that chat feature to ask any questions, share feedback and comments along the way. And then because you are on the webinar with us right now, one attendee today will be taking home a free Google Nest Hub, and we'll be giving that away at the end of today's webinar. So we're thrilled to have Mark back with us to help you become a master of time and take control of your day. Mark is a best-selling author, speaker, and advisor to businesses all across the country, and he's put together a really great presentation for you, to te for, for you today. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Mark. Great. Thanks, Stephen, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm excited about uh, taking the next hour and hopefully helping you with some time mastery. You know, time is one of those things that we all experience. We're all given 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, but I think the, rel the, the difference is in how we master time, not whether we have it or not. So what I'm going to be doing today to run through kind of the agenda, I'm going to start by spending a little time helping you to understand time. And we all know what it is, but I think helping you to just take a little bit of time to think about it will help. I'm also going to spend some time on why you want to potentially improve your time mastery skills, taking maybe some inventory of your time. Uh, one of the things that I think a lot of people that I work with and coach, whether it's leaders or individuals, uh, as it relates to time, I think they oftentimes think at least how they're spending their time is a little different than the reality. So I'm going to give you some tools and exercises. Um, developing time skills. Uh, and then we're going to actually give you today a time mastery system. A system is a process. A system is a recipe. It, system is a roadmap of how you can go about gaining more time out of your day. How can you feel less stress and feel more fulfilled? And then I'm going to talk about some mis common mistakes and then taking your kind of game to the next level. So with all that being said, I think there's three key ingredients, I think, for anybody if they're going to be successful with this or success in general. Number one is you have to have the right mindset. You got to be thinking about it the right way. You got to have the right attitude, the right work ethic towards it. Second is that you fundamentally need to have the skills. You can be doing high fives and group hugs, but if you don't have the skill set, you'll probably not be successful. And the last, which I think is a key kind of ingredient that fits together in this success formula, is in fact you've got to adjust and change. And when it comes to time, I think time is one of those things that we've seen probably more change than almost anyone else, anywhere else. Now, with all that being said, you know, all of you listening to this webinar, whether it's on a live or recorded, you're, you're not time masterful equal. You're not time mastery equal. So you, I would say you kind of fall into two, three categories. One is you may be, a, quite frankly, a hot mess. You may be in that rebuilding phase. You have to really start to rethink your time. How are you spending the time? I just encourage you, start with some baby steps and start with the basics. Uh, there's another group of folks out there in this webinar that, quite frankly, you're doing just fine. You're kind of plodding along. You want to maybe reduce some stress. You want to focus on a few of the weak links and you want to add a, a technique or two and just fundamentally kind of move your maybe game from a B to a B plus to an A minus. Then there's another group of you that probably are really quite proficient 
And you really want to take your game to the next level. You want to move from being an amateur on time mastery to a pro. You want to gain literal hours and see an ROI. You want to have accomplish those big goals that you've been talking about. And the only way to do it is by mastering time. And you really want to just kind of go to the next level. So I always like to start with why. Why is it that being in control and having more mastery of time is important? So if you think about this, the first thing is that many people want to reduce stress. So life has gotten very, very fast. The speed of time is such that it's kind of created a level of information and overwhelm that's out there that, you know, it's a tremendous amount of stress. Uh, you might want to accomplish more. You know, you have a fairly long, you know, things that you want to accomplish and you feel like you don't have enough time. Well, I would argue you have enough time. It's how you choose to spend your time that gives you enough time to be able to accomplish more. Uh, some people, quite frankly, they just want to improve. I mean, a lot of people I talk to, they want to, you know, get back into exercising. They want to spend more time reading. They want to spend more time in kind of educating and improving themselves. And the only way to do that is have more time. Uh, another re reason that you want to be in control is to just keep those promises. You know, you're just tired of disappointing, disappointing your family, disappointing your colleagues, you know, and just keep more promises. Another benefit, I think, of being in control and time mastery is it allows you to think more clearly. You know, life is going so fast and making the right decisions is, is just as important as any decision. So you've got to think more clearly about that. And certainly last but not least, it allows you to achieve not only the short-term activities you're so focused on, but the medium and long-term as well. So when you really look at kind of the, 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 the depth of this list, that you know the bottom line is, I think for anybody, they just wanna feel better. They just wanna feel more fulfilled in their life and in their day. And the, one of the best ways to do that is becoming more masterful of your time. So what I always like to do on any subject, whether it's a sport or whether it's a, uh, uh, related to just a, a lifestyle issue or whether it's related to a professional, is start to understand it a little bit more. And I think time is one of those things that you need to understand a little bit more. So the best way to understand it is look how it's changed over time. So think back 10 years, 15 years ago. You know, 15 years ago, technology was really optional in terms of your day-to-day -day lives, whereas we're completely dependent on technology today. That's a pretty dramatic shift in 10 to 15 years. 10 to 15 years ago, time would will build value. In other words, you would let someone know that you'd be back to them within 10 days on something, and their perception was not frustration, was, wow, you're investing time and energy. This must have value because it's going to take you a week or 10 days to do. Today, time's not on your side. There's so many businesses and processes that are built around speed. That's what the expectation is. Time kills deals today. Time is not on your side. In the past, free time. Today, time's not free. We don't even discuss it. I remember 20 years ago, you now normal kind of coffee machine type discussion is, well, what are you doing, Bob, in your free time this weekend? Well, we don't even think about free time anymore because it's not free. In the past, you could get back to people the next day or maybe even two, two days from now. Today, you have to get back to somebody either through a text or through a phone call back within an hour. So the speed at which time has changed. In the past, we talk about office hours. Today, you know, your work, right, wrong, or indifferent, is a 24-7 kind of dynamic. Now, I'm not saying for a minute that I'm advocating that. I'm just saying that that's kind of the expectation today, is that you have to be on or at least accessible more than you did in the past. And then lastly, in the past, we had 24 hours in a day. What do we have right now? Of course, the same 24 hours in a day. So as you really think about this slide, on the one hand, there's been a huge amount of change that's happened in terms of what's happening with time. And on the other hand, the amount of time that we have to do things, the amount of cards that were dealt are really the same as they've always been. 
And that creates a dynamic or a little bit of a paradox. It's a challenge. So let's talk just a little bit about some time wasters that are out there. Number one is you're not planning your day. You're not writing things down. You're talking. You're not listening. Simple tasks. There's so many simple little tasks that we do uh, every single day, whether it's our, our preparation as we get ready for work every day, whether it's making coffee, whatever those kind of th- simple tasks. There are oftentimes, if they're not done effectively or efficiently, they are wasting time. And it, when you discover how much time that they're wasting, you will realize that you can get a gift of time back if, in fact, you can acknowledge what they are. Not leveraging your time. You know, there's a lot of ways, for example, leverage your time. Uh, One of which is using that car time really differently. Using that time that you're doing exercise differently. Try to multitask certain things so that you can accomplish more. Another time waster is how you go about communicating. You know, today, you know, we have a tendency to use the technologies to communicate everything. And that's not necessarily always the most effective. It may be the most efficient, but then you go back and forth and back and forth. And a lot of misunderstandings are probably made as a result of that. Another time waster is being too fast or too slow. You know, I believe you have to choose the right speed of time, not necessarily the fastest. So one of the exercises I encourage you to do is actually to write down all the things that you think are your time wasters, because if you can acknowledge what those things are, the likelihood of you addressing them is so much greater. So let's just talk about a few time myths. These myths are the, you know, kind of the the things that aren't necessarily true. The first is faster is better. Now better is better. You know, finding the right pace, finding the right cadence is always better. There's not enough time. Well, no, it's how you choose to use the time. You know, there's a difference between the uber successful out there and they're given the same amount of time as you. What's different about them? It's how they choose to spend their time, not necessarily whether there's enough of it. You know, I don't have a time to plan. You have to plan. Matter of fact, when you use the planning system I'm going to be giving you today, you will get a dividend back that's two or three X of what you spend planning. Uh, It's okay to be late. You know, I heard an adage from my friend one time, late plus excuse equals on time. Not true, that's a myth. It's not okay to ever be late. Always, always, always be on time and you'll find that that is one way to master time is not necessarily be late. Focus on the top priority first, not necessarily true. You wanna focus on the right thing first, not necessarily the top priority. It takes what it takes. No, it takes what you choose for it to take. You know, you give me an hour in the grocery store, I'll figure out a way to fill it up. You give me 20 minutes to accomplish the same things, I'll use 20 minutes. It's a choice. How much time something takes is what you choose for it to take. And then lastly, as I've already highlighted, you know, don't think about time being free. It's really not free. And I think the more that you can... Uh, focus on the time in the right way, you'll be more successful. So one way to continue to think about understanding is making time more meaningful. So what I like to do is think about, you know, simple things. Like what imagine if you were able to save 10 minutes in one day? I mean, there's so many ways you can save 10 minutes in one way. You will absolutely, with this system I'm giving you, save at least 30 minutes, if not an hour, hour and a half a day. But just 10 minutes a day is... 3,650 a year is 61 hours in a year. That's just 10 minutes a day. You think about that. Now think about the gift of 61 hours in a year, what you would ultimately do with that. Now let's translate this out further. 30 minutes is 183 hours in a year. And then lastly, 60. That's... (coughs) 365 hours in a year. So the question is, what do you do with all this extra time? It's a lot more meaningful to you if you know what to do with it. Okay, the next topic I want to get into is a whole subject of efficient versus effective. Efficient, it's all about doing things with the least resources in the short amount of time. Effective, on the other hand, is all about accomplishing the, 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 the goal that you want to try to accomplish. Now, 
you know, the reason that this is so important is that you always want to focus on being more effective, not necessarily more efficient. I mean, oftentimes we get that confused when we're working on time management systems. No, it's about being effective, not being efficient. So let's take some inventory of time. Always know your numbers. So one of the areas that is a foundational area that you'll never get really better at time mastery unless you really try to tackle this one. And that one is to be proactive versus reactive. So one exercise I like everybody to do for themselves is you can see this and you can do this just with a little pad of paper and you can think about it is what percentage of your day is reactive that others control versus proactive. So what I want you to do is write down two numbers. The first one is reactive. What percentage of your day others control versus proactive. Now, in the spirit of this webinar, I'm going to go ahead and give you some insights on it, but I do want you to reflect on this because so many of the processes and I'm, systems I've given you later, you're not going to be very effective with it unless you get the proactive blend up where it needs to be. Now, I just did a workshop yesterday with a group that had varied anywhere from 20% reactive to 80% reactive. Needless to say, the ones that are 20% reactive are much more buttoned up, tighter, accomplishing more, more successful than the 80%. So your goal, I would say, is if you have the right either leadership or sales position, project management type of position, then you want to be at an 80% proactive and 20% reactive kind of blend. So let's just look at the three sources for this. Three sources of reactive activity. One are your clients, two are your team members, and three is your family. Now, they represent, in my opinion, about 80% of all your reactive time. So if, in fact, you're in a full-service kind of remodeling business or you're in a business that I think has a lot of clients that you actually work with, one way to deal with this on Monday morning is know that these clients are going to interrupt you throughout the week. So rather than wait for that, if you got 10 clients, 20 clients that might interrupt you, then you want to proactively reach out to them and just communicate and try to set a time in advance that you want to be able to speak to them or be able to acknowledge their activity or their challenge that you want to do that. If you can do that, you're going to find that a high percentage of that reactive time will go down. The other thing, the other one is your team and is and family is similar to this. So rather than being constantly interrupted by things and being frustrated by your interruptions from your team members, what I'd like you to do is actually stop them and ask them, would it be okay if you address their question and problem in about an hour? Then you schedule it with them and then you circle back so you're not being interrupted. What's interesting is I've studied this. About a third of the time, they're going to say, sure, that'd be just fine. So you schedule it and you're not interrupted. A third of the time, they're going to say, no, it's an emergency. And then another third of the time, they're going to probably go and handle it themselves. So literally two thirds of the time, you're not being interrupted. So you will be able to, uh, you'll be able to gain that amount of proactive time in your day. So a few proactive tips. Number one, take inventory. And what I mean by that, what are the real sources for you, the individuals for you that you're constantly reacting to? Because they're the ones that you want to target first. Number two is try to just improve in little baby steps first. Uh, establish the time allowed and then do it. So in other words, if, for example, I've got a task to do, if I can say, okay, I need to do this task in 20 minutes uh, with a person, rather than just allowing that time to fill the void that's in your day, you're gonna be more effective in terms of being proactive. Set appointments, set appointments for those things. Literally set appointments just like you do appointments with clients or appointments with other team members. Say no occasionally. I know no sounds like a harsh kind of negative word, but it's really not because it's gonna flush out the why behind whether you should address something. And then the last, which we'll talk a little bit more about, is you got to plan. You got to plan your work today, every day, and then work your plan. So let's look at the time blend for a minute. One way to take inventory of your time is you look at categories of your time 
And I want to show you a little chart that I did as an exercise that you can actually do this chart for yourself. It's very simple, simple little matrix. And on the, on the left side, you have the different activities. This was done with a salesperson that helped them to understand how they were spending their time and how that could improve. So I asked them, how many hours per week did they do with sales appointments or marketing activities or training, so on and so on. Then we went on, okay, what does that represent in the percentage of time in that particular week? So that gives us a percentage. It gives us kind of like a pie chart. Then I said, okay, if you had a blank canvas and you could start from scratch, how many hours would you spend per week on sales appointments? And this individual said, I'd like to do one more a week and they like to do a little bit more marketing per week. That way they get better quality leads and do a little bit more training so that they could get their close rate up a little bit higher. They, the project work, uh, they would be about the same. And then they wanted to get a little bit more efficient on some of the internal meetings, some of the site visits, and certainly some of the administrative tasks. Those things generally you can button up. Now, in this person's case, because he spent a little bit more time on the sales, because he increased the marketing, got better leads, and because he was better trained to do it, he increased his close rate and his sales to a higher point and gave himself a 25 to 30% raise as a result of it. This was all a product of a time exercise and how he was spending his time. So you could do that exercise for yourself. Now, another way to look at your time is looking at when where and what activity you're doing. Now, let me give you an example. This is an example of actually that of my typical day, and I wanna just use it as an example, but you need to do this exercise for yourself. So on the far left, it's when you do the different activities. You know, some people at this workshop I led yesterday, I asked the audience, how many of you are morning people? Hands went up. How many of you are evening people? Hands went up. Half of the hands are morning, half of the hands are, are evening. Now, what that tells me is we're, all, we're not all the same. In other words, how we're wired and when we like to do certain things varies depending on when it is during the day. So as you think about this exercise, break it down into parts. You have early morning, mid-morning, late morning, midday, afternoon, evening, and late evening. You have a kind of a mindset. You have a DNA. You have a activity kind of... Uh, uh, thinking process that happens. So in my case, early morning is reflective, mid morning's creative, late morning's productive, so on and so on all the way through the day. So then you say, okay, what are those activities that I would ideally want to do um, early in the morning? Okay, early in the morning, maybe a deeper reflective planning exercise. Um, mid morning is thinking, designing, preparing, uh, late morning is, is kind of production-related things, presentations, kind of action-oriented things. And then midday, which tends to be a little bit more interactive, uh, that's when I have a lot of, for example, conference calls and meetings and interactive and webinars and those kind of things. And then late in the day, when I need to kind of wind down, that's when some of the administrative tasks, uh, some of the things that you don't have to necessarily think too much about, and you can kind of wind down. And then you just transition out through the balance of your day. So if you take this little chart, you can actually determine not only what the mindset is for you, when it is, what the activities are, but then now also on the far right, we have where you do those things. What I find when I coach different people is there are certain places that you do these things that are better than others. For example, early in the morning, if you want to be reflective and you want to be doing planning exercise, you need to do it in a very, very quiet place. Whereas I think if you're dealing with, you know, kind of catching up or people, those kind of things and where you can bounce around, you don't have to be isolated in a, in a quiet uh, setting or a quiet office. So let's kind of talk about making time visual. You know, what's interesting is that, you know, if, if you can see it, you actually get it. You'll understand it better. You know, I think about 80% of the people out there are more visual thinkers. And visual comes in the form of calendars, comes in the form of timelines, Gantt charts, a lot of different diagrams, those kind of things. That kind of brings simple data to life, and our brains can process it more. 
the time mastery system that I'm going to be talking with you about is very much about that. It's about helping you, I think, understand and make it visual. So one area that you need to think about is also how do you go about being more proficient at estimating time? In other words, estimating how long certain things should take. Now, what I recommend is a few tips on this is, number one, try to make estimating time a little bit of a game. In my exercise, I'm going to give you, you're going to need to be fairly proficient at estimating how long things take so you can add up the time, determine whether there's that amount of time in the day to be able to do it. If you can't estimate time, then you've got to become more masterful at it. So first tip is try to make it fun. It's not painful. You know, make it like a game. Think of it like a score in a football game or think of it like odds of winning and losing and all those kinds. It actually can get kind of fun. Second is, as you're estimating time, you want to be what I call aggressive but realistic. In other words, you want a little bit of an edge to it. In other words, you don't want to be just sitting on your hands, but you also want to estimate time that's very realistic, take into account other things that are happening. The other thing when you're estimating and getting better and better at it, you have to write it down. It's not just what's floating in your head at that moment. Write it down because you will change your perception of how long something will take depending on your mindset. And third is you can't eat an elephant in one bite, so you have to break it in parts. And I think the more that you can break it in parts, the more successful you're going to be. So the next thing that we want to get into is the actual time mastery system itself. Now, I call this a system because it literally is just that. It's a system. It's a process. And, you know, I, I love this quote from Norman Vincent Peale. It was plan your work for today and every day, then work your plan. Every single word in this quote is really quite important. Plan your work for today. So it's plan and it all starts with a plan. It's not you just dive in head first and cross your fingers and hopefully you've got a roadmap. Your work, that's what you do for today, not for tomorrow, not for yesterday, but for today, you got to do it every day because that's how you become masterful at something. That's how you develop habits. And then you go and work your plan. So you do not start your plan, start your day until you have a plan. Every word in this little quote is very important. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through a time mastery process uh, that I think will help you to uh, uh, kind of map this out. Think of it like a recipe. Think of it like if you wake up and you kind of have a yearning for, uh, you know, making whatever, uh, some special meal, uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to go and you want to look at a recipe. And then you want to look at your inventory of what you have. And then you want to go to the grocery store. And then you want to come back and prepare your parts and pieces. Then you want to preheat the oven. Then you want to put it and mix it and put it in the oven. And then you want to sit back and follow that. If you want to see the predictable results, you've got to do it the same way every time. Now, I'm not encouraging you to be mechanical, but I am encouraging you, rather than just jumping into the car and going to the grocery store and not writing down what you're going to need as a list, uh, you're going to be more effective following a process. So what does this mean? So first thing is set up. Next is brain dump, time to reflect on things. Then we want to move to the proper time activities, the timeline setup, the analysis of the brain dump, then blocking out the activities, and then moving down into launching, and then, of course, monitoring. Now, I know I just went over that real fast, and my friends here at Surefire, I just want to say they will send you a copy of this presentation if you ref you ask for it, that you can go back and you can look at it more carefully, you can follow it, but they'll also send you a copy of my book, Time Mastery. In this book, I've spelled out a lot of little tips and a lot of little ways to be able to do a lot of these things that'll help. They'll send you this book as purely a compliment, complimentary book just by having a simple conversation with one of their team. So let's talk about if you do decide to want to take your time mastery game to the next level, let's just talk about the first 30 days. Number one is you need 30 days if you want to form a habit. The first week is going to be tough, just like going back to the gym. The first week is not fun. It's tough. But you will get that runner's high eventually, but it takes some time. 
You want to follow the techniques 100%. Uh, you've got to invest, and this is important. You've got to invest a minimum of 30 minutes every day into these techniques. Now, if you do that, I will give you, after 30 days, a dividend of one to two hours of savings of time. But you have to invest 30 minutes a day to get that dividend. Include the personal and professional activities. Try to be disciplined, but not obsessed by it. This is intended to be a tool, not a straitjacket to help you. So moving into the steps themselves. Step one is what I call the setup. So you must be in a quiet place. So imagine for a moment that you're getting ready. You've, got, you've, you've kind of gotten ready for work and you're, you're kind of just reading the newspaper or something. You say, okay, now I want to go do my, my time mastery system for 30 minutes before I launch into the day. So the first thing is you need to find a quiet place and you need to start it before your first appointment, before your first scheduled activity. You need that amount of time because you don't want to do it in a rushed way. Everyone needs to use a spiral notebook. Now, this is a simple. It sounds very uh, dogmatic, but it's important that you use a spiral notebook because, number one, you have a record. Number two, you're going to carry it with you so that you can monitor what your plan is. Uh, all of your data, when you're sitting down and setting up all your data, all your notes, your computer, your phone, all that you want to have in front of you because you want to be able to put together a plan that's the most effective it can be. Uh, turn off your cell phone. You want this to be a quiet, reflective time. You don't want to get interrupted. So now you're ready to plan. So here's how you go about doing it. You take your eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, and I'm gonna walk you through step by step of how to do this, but you've gotta kind of visualize it a little bit. And again, in my book, this is all laid out for you in a much simpler, clear way, but imagine you have a notebook, a spiral notebook, eight and a half by 11. So on the top left, left side, you wanna put the uh, date and you wanna put a theme for the day. A theme is just what you're thinking about that day. It could be balance, could be if you're involved in sales, landing the planes. It could be, uh, you know, juggle multiple balls, whatever that theme is for you. Then what you're going to want to do is do a brain dump. Now, your brain dump is all those different activities that you want to do that particular day. Now, these are literally a dump. They're writing down as fast as you can. You're going to abbreviate. You're going to put in the personal and the professional thing. So in the one I just gave, put up here on the screen, in this case, lunch, setting meetings with different people, calling John at Felux for a training, having a meeting for a sales profile system, uh, meeting with uh, a past client, uh, getting a birthday card for my wife, setting a one-on-one -on -one meeting, uh, having a, a call with the landlord on a lease and, and other things, talking a little bit about... Uh, uh, you know, called a gym and setting a meeting with uh, uh, a kitchen meeting, uh, having a call with my friend in Oregon uh, about an idea, an issue, setting, I had a radio show for many years, so had a, to check with the radio uh, uh, station schedule on some things. And then you get to the point of reactive. Now, that's where the brain dump is done when you're done. You stop. The next step is what you call more of a reflective step. That's where you uh, have new training concepts you might want to put in. That's where you might set another meeting with someone. The next thing that you want to do is uh, attach the time to each one of these activities. Now, you do it in the form of minutes. I recommend with everybody on their reflective time, that's a reactive time, you put down, everybody start with 120 minutes a day. Now, this will change after a month or two of you doing it. You'll either increase it or decrease it. In my case, I allow 40 minutes a day for reactive time. And I used to allow only 30, but I was finding myself falling a little bit short. So I added a little bit more, and I find that's the right place for me to be. Now, you, what I'd like you to do, because you're new at this system, is start with 120 and then gear it down after you know you have extra time in the day. The next thing you want to do is really add up the amount of minutes that you just put in. So all those minutes add up to 365 
uh, minutes divided by 60 is 11.25 hours in a day. Now you can see on the right side where I have the time, I have about 11 and a half hours of window in the day. So that tells me it's validating that I can fit all that in in one day. The next thing is you wanna do is set up a timeline. Now the timeline is to make it visual. I like to see it. 80% of the people are visual thinkers. You like to see it. So you set up a timeline there that shows you beginning to end, start and finish, and it blocks out different elements that kind of fall into your day based on meetings, drives, activities you have to do that day. The next thing you want to do is take those different activities and, and block them out. I usually like to use the symbols A, B, C, D, and so on for that different time slot. The next thing you want to do is then block out, literally cross out the areas that you have a meeting, you have a, an activity or something you have to do in that block of time so that you're not trying to put any one of these other activities in that time slot. In the B time slot and the uh, E time slot, I happen to have uh, meetings that were already predetermined meetings, so I had to block those out. The next thing you want to do is you want to hook these two charts together. So on the left side of your page, you have all the activities and the amount of time. On the right side of the page, you have a timeline. So as you can see, when I block those out, you know, I want to do lunch at D. Why? Because it's logical to do it in the middle of the day when I'm hungry and so on and so on. So as you move through the day, it's very logical, the parts and the pieces, as they fit in. If you're not sure, you can put two letters in or you can put an X so that you can just plug it in whenever it's convenient. But the reality is it all has to add up and it all has to fit. The next thing you wanna do is a, kind of a quick little analysis of the brained up and see if it fits. So in this case, I added up all the A's and then I looked at how much time between seven and 8.30, my A time slot, which is 90 minutes, 80 minutes fits into 90 minutes. So I'm validating that that will work for me and so on throughout the whole day. The next thing that you want to do is launch the A's. Now, because you've done this and you can, you've done it properly, you don't need to think about each step in this journey. All you need to do is focus on the time slot you're in. So needless to say, the first time slot you're in is your A's. So I don't need to focus on being overwhelmed by the day. I just need to focus on those three things, setting some meetings, reviewing a contract, and checking the radio schedule. Those are the three activities that I allowed time for that I needed to do in that amount of time. I oftentimes have gotten to the point where I don't even remember what I'm supposed to be doing in the, other, in the rest of the day, but I don't care. And I don't care because I have the map. I have the roadmap. I have the blueprint for my day right in front of me. So I can focus in a much deeper way on the activity at hand rather than worried about remembering the other things that need to happen. It's kind of like a map in a journey. It's kind of like a GPS. You don't have to think about what is that road that I turn in an hour when all you do is follow each step of the path. And once you get to that, it'll tell you what that road is that you'll need to turn. Monitoring. Monitoring the process is really, really important. Uh, think about monitoring the process like flying, a, flying an airplane. Now, needless to say, when you're on an airplane, the pilot makes many adjustments along the way based on weather, based on air traffic, based on headwinds. All those kind of things affect the flight itself and affect their judgment and what they're doing along that flight to get you to the to the uh, destination, ideally at the right place and roughly at the right time. You know, your day and your journey of monitoring is in fact equally important. So what you have to do is every 60 to 90 minutes, you're gonna wanna monitor the progress. You're gonna wanna look, how am I doing? And then in the middle of the day, I encourage people to do kind of what I call more of a halftime report of, of what, what it should be. So the next one you wanna look at here uh, is in fact, uh, if you have too much time. So in this case, I changed some of the times and now I have 13 and a half hours. I can't start my day without adjusting. 
So what I encourage, go back to that list. Don't just cross out some of the member things on the list. Just try to find faster ways of doing it or break it in parts. And maybe, you, for example, if in this case you had a phone call with someone on the West Coast, maybe you say, you know, what I'll do is send out an email. I'll let them know I only have 20 minutes for the call and here are the key priorities of the things that I want to cover in that 20 minutes. So what you have to do is you have to adjust what those activities are and the amount of time and literally carve out that amount of time so you can get it down to the window that you have available. I'm not uh, one that encourages just adding more time onto your day so that you can get it done. You've got to determine that at the beginning of the process, and then you've got to work to the plan. Okay, a few monitoring tips. Monitor every 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, make sure that you carry your notebook with you. You know, this is literally, think of it like a builder and a blueprint under your arm while you're going around supervising the work. You have it right in front of you because it's your roadmap. Uh, allow 10 minutes in the middle of the day, you know, for maybe a half time to tweak the plan. Uh, write down any notes in your notebook. So you'll find with this notebook, you have a, an opposing page that you can write down notes that then can be transferred later into the next day or on follow-up items. Uh, do a deep dive review at the end of the day. It's always a good idea to do that. You know, where was this day effective? Where, where did I fall short? The more that you do a deep dive, you'll learn and you'll be more effective of what your right cadence is, what your right pace is, and then you'll be uh, more, more successful. So a few common mistakes, and we're moving to the final leg here of our little webinar, and I'm gonna, I've am gonna i got a special thing to share with you towards the end called a stress cloud that's, cloud that's kind of a, a fun thing to do. Uh, so some common mistakes I see is forcing 10 hours uh, or, or 14 hours in a 10-hour day. It doesn't work. All you're going to do is disappoint and frustrate yourself. The second thing is your activities are too general. So what you want to do is be a little bit more specific on the activities. For example, if you have to put together a proposal, don't just say the Jones proposal. Say Jones outline, Jones estimate, Jones contract. Break it down into parts and then allow the right amount of time for the right amount of parts. Uh, doing a short plan, that doesn't really work. Uh, it's kind of like you know, trying to do whatever, exercise in 10 minutes as opposed to 30 or 45 minutes. It's not really effective to do that. So don't do 15 minute plans. You might as well not waste your time doing that. One of the things I see when I coach people on this system is I look at what they're doing. I have them send me a photograph of what they're doing and I can immediately tell how long they took to do the plan. So for many people, they need to look at a clock. And when you look at a clock, you dive into creating a plan, you do all the steps I've outlined in this plan, and then ultimately see how long it takes. That gives you a better sense. Another common mistake is not being in a quiet place. This is not an exercise that you do uh, on the breakfast table with your kids. You know, that's not the right kind of environment. Just find the quiet place. If you have to find a, even a quiet place in the corner of a fast food restaurant to be able to do it, because it, your, your office is not environment for it, that's fine. Once you get into your day, you can have the noise and activity, but to do the plan, you need a quiet place. Don't get creative in my process. Now, this sounds a little bit, you know, a tough love, but the reality is when I see uh, and am coaching people on doing what they're doing, more times than not, it's because they're doing it their way rather than the system and there's a reason for everything I've shared for you. Not monitoring every 60 to 90 minutes. And then the biggest mistake is just giving up. It's kind of giving up on that diet, giving up on that exercise routine. If you can hang in there for 30 days, that's how long it's going to take you to start to see real returns. Then you're going to really take your game to the next level. So frequently asked questions. So one question is, should I do this over the weekend? Uh, I think you should kind of give up your time a little bit to yourself and to your family over the weekend. So if you want to do it over the weekend, it's certainly an option, but I don't encourage it. Uh, can I use another type of notebook? 
rather than the spiral eight and a half by 11. No, you've got to use that size. Uh, that size is what's appropriate. Uh, and that's what it takes. Uh, when should I do a uh, return of emails and, and, and calls? Well, if you build in the right amount of reactive time, it'll fit in between things. Some people who have a lot of return calls and emails, they like to block out a couple of chunks of time during the day that that's what they do. Uh, can I do the planning the night before? The answer is no. Something mysteriously happens, and you can create a to-do list the night before, but not a plan. Uh, what if my brain dump doesn't add up to the time that's allowed in the day? Wow, that would be a gift. If that happens, then you've got to add more things to your activity list. Those activity things, they don't have to be necessarily work things. They could be fun things. It could be taking the dog for a walk or going on a run or maybe having a lunch with a friend or something. But what you do want is the image of the two to kind of match up. The total amount of time in your plan to roughly the total amount of time in your day. Uh, can I make changes of the plan during the day? Absolutely, you need to. Just like that pilot, he's adjusting that flight plan as he's moving across. Uh, what happens if my day crashes and burns? Well, this will happen occasionally, hopefully not very often. You'll have a car problem and it breaks and it causes your day. You'll get a call from your kid's school that causes your day to crash and burn. What I usually recommend is once you see that the day being off track, just regroup and do a new plan based on that later time in the day. It might be that you start your day rather than at eight o'clock, you start it at 11 o'clock after you deal with that, that challenge. Okay. Another little technique that's kind of fun is a, what I call the stress clouds. Stress clouds are something that, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a fun kind of metaphor. But if you imagine, for example, we all have stress, we all have weight, we all have things on our back that kind of causes us to be, you know, maybe not as effective or not feeling as up or feeling a little bit down at time. You know, so I was thinking about this a few years ago, and I started to think about it in terms of sunlight and clouds. You know, those days that the sun is shining through, then there's no clouds or very little stress, you know, you feel much better. Those days that are really gloomy and totally uh, overcast and what have you, the days you don't feel so good. So if you think about those things that are causing the stress as the clouds, then what you want to do is you want to think about ways that those clouds can vaporize a little bit. So here's the process. The first thing you wanna do is create a little stick figure, that's you. And then you wanna create some clouds. Each one of these clouds, and I usually, when I do this exercise, I'll do it typically about every seven to 10 days. I'll have anywhere from three to five or six clouds. Some of them are big, some of them are small, but you wanna draw bigger clouds and littler clouds that reflect the level of stress that that gives you. Now, needless to say, if you have a whole bunch of clouds or a really giant cloud, that sun's not shining through. So you want to figure out ways to kind of get it to vaporize. So then you want in each one of those clouds to write, what is that stress? So in this case, you had, I had a meeting with Jones. I had a preparation for a trip I was doing and I had a talk I was giving. Every one of those were kind of weighing on me at that moment. The next thing I want to do is write down a list of anywhere from two to four things that are ways I can get feel less stressed on that particular item. So for example, with the Jones meeting, I just needed to write out a detailed outline. I need to set the expectations for the particular client, and I wanted to confirm everyone that was going to be there. I knew if I did those things, it would be less stressful for me and something that I think would, would certainly help. The other thing you see in the trip, I want to confirm details, pack and do the agenda, those kind of things. So as you move along here, you can see that you want to just then weave those activities into your daily planning. So then this stress, this literal cloud starts to vaporize and become smaller and smaller. More sun, sun will shine through and you'll feel much better. So then you want to monitor this. So I don't encourage you necessarily look at this every single day, but go back and look at this every three to five days. And then, like I said, for most people that do this exercise, doing it about every seven to 10 days is about the right length of time. 
So that's the process. And you want to do this yourself by just literally drawing in that, that, uh, the, the clouds, the to-do list. So moving towards the final leg of our little webinar here, I want to talk about monitoring. You know, monitoring is really, really key to be successful in terms of mastering time. So one simple way to do this is looking at kind of longer term monitoring. You want to create a chart that's really simple. And I want to share this with you because if you create a matrix that's focused on the, you know, the daily monitoring you do, the weekly monitoring, then the monthly and quarterly monitoring, it'll help you take your game to the next level. And you want to review these actions every single day. And as a result of that, you want to review on a daily basis only the things that you should review on a daily basis, and then the weekly and the biweekly and the monthly, you want to let those extend on. So uh, keep in mind, I've given you a lot. It's kind of drinking out of a fire hose here. Uh, I love this little quote here, intentions without actions equal squat. If you took the time to listen to this webinar, you clearly had some pain. You clearly had a thirst for improving on time mastery. So what I'm encouraging, if you don't act on them, then those intentions that you had are a waste of time. They, they mean squat. So what I would encourage you to do is contact the folks at Surefire, get my book. You can also order it online yourself through Amazon or other major outlets. Uh, but also ask, you know, as Stephen said, uh, you'll get a copy of this webinar. So uh, you know, you'll be able to review these slides again. But some of the key takeaways we talked about, mastering time really is a choice. You either choose to do it or you don't. You know, if you fail to plan, then plan to fail. Take 30 days and that will form a habit and that habit will stick. Be proactive, not reactive. If you want to be successful at time mastery, you have got to make sure the right amount of proactiveness is happening. Monitor, monitor, monitor. If you don't monitor, don't memorialize and let your plan sit and gain dust throughout the day. You want to be very active with it. And the numbers, they don't lie. So at the end of all this, I want to thank everybody for joining. I'm going to turn this back over to Stephen, and he's going to wrap up a few things with you. But uh, I want to thank everybody for listening today. And certainly, I wish you a lot of luck. And do try to you know, really gain, I think, the kind of things that you want. All right. Thank you, Mark. That was a lot of great material. And I do hope everyone was able to learn something new today, because that's ultimately what this is all about. Um, so now before I announce the winner of the Google Nest Hub, I wanted to offer everyone the chance to get a free copy of Mark's best-selling book in exchange for a brief conversation with us about your digital marketing. So that poll is now live. Um, you can select one of the answers there. It's a really great opportunity for you to explore how you can take advantage of innovations in marketing technology to streamline core business processes, maximize your marketing dollars, and also get a book that'll help you take your mindset and your business to the next level. So please take a moment, let us know if you're interested in joining a call or share for our local if you say yes, we'll be in touch with after the webinar with next steps. I'm going to leave that open just for another few seconds. You can also email marketing at surefirelocal.com as well. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to close the poll. Thank you to everyone who said yes for joining the call. We'll, um, we look forward to continuing the conversation with you. And now on to today's giveaway. The lucky winner of the Google Nest Hub is going to be Brittany Brewer. Congrats, Brittany. If you can, please email marketing at surefirelocal.com with your full mailing address, and we'll be sure to ship that out, out for you uh, right in time for the holidays coming up. And then... As I bring today's webinar to a close, again, a huge thank you to you, Mark, for, take, for leading today's talk, and then to all of you for taking the time out of your day to join us. We do hope you learned something new. If you can, please take a minute to fill out the survey that you'll see at the end of this webinar, and just let us know how we did today. 
and then also what topics you would like to hear about in the future. We love checking out these topics you suggest when we plan our future webinars. And with that, thank you, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.